back to the Fourth Way Podcast. It is that time in the season when we take a little break because it is the end of a section. Uh, we just completed a section in our season on propaganda on race, uh, how propaganda is wielded in regard to racism. And so we are going to kind of stop here for a minute and uh, hopefully I'm going to convey to you a, a few conclusions, maybe a little bit of recap, and then importantly, the uh, resources, some of the, the resources that I want to highlight and recommend for you as you pursue further study, as well as mentioning some conspiracies that I didn't get to because I really only generally highlight one conspiracy uh, in every section, but there's so many more that I, I have to choose from. Uh, and so I want to give you guys some extensions for further research if you'd like. Now in this section of the season, you'll notice that I did a lot more interviews than I did uh, for our section on abuse, and I, I didn't do any, at least not at this point, uh, while I'm recording this. I have not done any uh, interviews in regard to the, the first section, just propaganda in general. Now I've done... I don't know, maybe eight or ten interviews so far that I've, I've recorded already for the season on propaganda. and But I've reached out to a lot of people. I mean, whatever book I'm reading is usually the best book at, you know, whatever, whatever I'm reading in the moment, that is the best book at that point. And I'm like, oh, I gotta, gotta contact this author and, and talk to them. And I've contacted a lot of the people that I, I have read. Some of the people are dead. Some of the people uh, I wouldn't be that interested in. Um, but yeah, I've contacted a lot of people and, and even people that, that aren't on my Goodreads list. Like I'll just throw out some names here of people that I have contacted. Uh, I contacted uh, the Christian rapper Propaganda uh, after reading his book, Terraform, uh, and, and listening to some of his music, which, which deals with uh, certain aspects of racism. I've contacted Tom McDonald because he's got a song on propaganda. And honestly, I mean, I know that he's, uh, he's I think he's pretty far on the right uh, as far as people view him. But uh, I mean, what you'll notice is a lot of the people that I interview end up being more on the left side of the spectrum. And it's, I want you to understand, it's not at all because I only reach out to people on the left side of the spectrum. I've reached out to uh, Marvin Alasky, who is uh, you know, an individual in the, the PCA, a conservative Christian denomination of which I'm a part. Uh, he was the head of World Magazine, Discovery Institute, uh, part of that. So uh, Rachel Den Hollander reached out to her. I mean, I've, I've reached out to a lot of people. I, I would say probably like, I don't know, 60 60 different people that I've reached out to you like YouTubers um, who who uh, who do various sorts of things I mean, I've reached out to a lot of people people from behind the bastards podcast okay so you get the point um, now for the most part nobody I mean there are a lot of people who don't respond to me right I'm a nobody who am I? I I don't even you know I just I'm from a small podcast they've never heard of uh, so I, I don't have a PR person who's going to reach out to them. So most people just ignore me. Um, there are some people who are polite and and respond and uh, just say they aren't interested. And then uh, I've I've had uh, I had one who was pretty blunt about it. She just uh, said um, when when I uh, told her what podcast I did and and uh, what we're about, she's like, uh, "No, nah, I don't want to do that whole Christian thing." Uh, I forget exactly how she put it, but she said something like it, it wouldn't be good for her, right? Well, I appreciate the honesty. Like, I, I genuinely do. Like, I would rather have somebody um, not play these niceties and just say, hey, look, I'm not going to do it. Great. I, I respect that. But that was kind of a, a glimpse uh, into this whole propaganda world in and of itself, trying to to get these interviews with people. Because... What that one person said, what that one author said, I think is probably true of more than just her. You know, with uh, so with with this individual, it was oh yeah, Christian. You know, talking with a Christian wouldn't look good for me. Okay, um, for some other individual or individuals, um, it, it who are on the other side of the spectrum, the, the more the right of the spectrum. 
be like, uh, we're we're talking about propaganda and and uncovering that in you know the church or uncovering it in uh, government, which you know we we like our government. We're from a you know the the United States of America, and our founding fathers were Christian. Like we can't soil that that reputation, right? So. I think it goes it goes on both sides of the aisle here, but for that one lady to to say like I can't really associate with Christians because it wouldn't be good for my book sales or whatnot. Um, I mean that's exactly what we're talking about in this season is this polarization. Like I would love to sit down and talk to. I've watched uh, this this uh, great YouTube channel, The Second Thought, uh, by this guy who's like a Marxist. I would love to talk to him. I would love to talk to Tom McDonald. I would love to talk to Marvin Olasky. Like, I would love to talk to all of these people, right, left, center, and and hear what is going on in their experience in their heads. It would be a wonderful thing. But what this one individual showed, and, and I think is, again, is representative of more than just her, is that people are trying to be really cautious about how they sell themselves. I mean, in in an age of uh, you know, with Instagram, Facebook, whatever, TikTok, whatever, like is going on right now, as you're listening to this, whatever the big thing is, you have to present yourself a certain way. You can't just uncover and reveal truth. You have to have some sort of facade, some sort of way that you present yourself. You can't have a discussion with certain types of people. You can't have a discussion about certain types of ideas. That just wouldn't be good for your image. An image is what we're selling not truth. And it's when you can't have those kinds of conversations with people from all over the spectrum. It's when you have this polarization that there are, I mean, you see that you are extremely propagandized. Now I understand the argument with people, I think it was like Dawkins who refuses to, uh, or refuse to uh, engage with, with certain brands of Christianity or Christians in general in a debate where he's like, I don't want to validate that position. He thinks it's so ridiculous and so stupid. I mean, should we have debates with uh, with neo Nazis about uh, the the humanity of Jews or minorities, black people, wh- whatever? Um, I'm not convinced that we should. Uh, and and there are certain things that we, I guess, we all just think are are too crazy that you'd validate it by by discussing it. So I don't know where that line is. Nevertheless, it was at least something interesting to me to observe while I was reaching out to people for interviews, and it's something that that maybe you should chew on too and figure out at what point are you validate, validating something that shouldn't be validated, and at what point are you giving into propaganda and becoming polarized and, and refusing to be willing to think critically or to uh, view the humanity in somebody else who might disagree with you. And you know, maybe as I'm talking here, maybe that's the line for me. You know, I think of this guy named Daryl Davis, I believe is his name, who uh, he's famous because he uh, he's all over like the different news stations and, and YouTube and stuff because he's this black guy who sat down and and talked with or, or converted like over 200 KKK members to come out of the, the KKK. Now, he didn't do that by like posting cool Instagram photos of himself. Uh, not that posting cool Instagram photos of yourself is bad, but that's not how he did it. He sat down and he had conversations with them. Okay, I, I can understand Dawkins not wanting to have a debate, right? Uh, maybe he's he's scared that he'll not represent his position strongly enough and, and some people will be, end up believing the Christian. Maybe he thinks Christianity is too crazy, too harmful. Like, whatever he thinks. Okay. But, I don't know, it seems like having a discussion about things and and being asked questions as one tries to understand your thoughts, it seems like that's on a different scale. And it seems like that's what somebody like Daryl Davis did, right? He sits down and has, has a discussion with somebody like those in the KKK, who a lot of black people probably would view as almost subhuman, right? Uh, even if they wouldn't say it, right? I view them as practically subhuman, right? It, it's hard for me to love them. Yet Daryl Davis sat down and had conversations with them. And conversations, relationships, uh, discussions, those aren't validations, I don't think. And so I think we need to, um, we need to be careful 
about this idea of refusing to validate uh, as, as meaning we can't be in conversation with people. If that's the case, then uh, Daryl Davis and his conversion of the 200-plus KKK members shouldn't exist, right? That's not a good thing that he sat down and he talked with them. Anyway, that is not the introduction I planned, but uh, yeah, hopefully it sheds some light on the process as, as we uh, dig into the rest of the season. So let's, uh, let's get to this episode in particular, um, a discussion on uh, our, our concluding to the, the section on race and propaganda. When it comes to recommending resources for um, race, it is very difficult for me because this is probably one of the topics that I have read the, the most on in the last several years. Um, politics, race, and, uh, and you know, nonviolence Christianity would be the, the three topics I've read the most about. So there are a lot of these books that, um, that I've actually read prior to studying for, for the season on propaganda. And so I'm not going to remember a ton of details about each of these. I just remember these books as, as standing out. Um, so what I would recommend is go to, for my Goodreads reading list, I have a propaganda, truth, atrocities, conspiracies reading list. So you can go check that out for specific propaganda-related stuff. But then you might also want to check out the, uh, the, my racism uh, or race and gender equality. I forget what I titled it. But you can go check out that, uh, that reading list as well. And there's going to be some things in there that I didn't end up uh, labeling as propaganda because it was before I, I had propaganda in view. So you can go check those out. And um, that might be helpful for you too. So let's start off with uh, recommendations for kind of like the the larger scale systemic view of things. Uh, I think it's I think it's important to understand how racism is is baked in, or or where you're going to see people argue for racism baked into the system. And so I'd recommend books like uh, Chokehold, which I really liked because it's uh, I believe the author is a, a black guy who was a prosecutor or a DA or something, uh, and so he kind of is able to give you a perspective from from that side of the law as a black man uh, and, and kind of how he changed his mind on, on some things. And so that was really, really valuable in my opinion. Um, you can do similar things in, in regard to the criminal justice system, the condemnation of blackness that, that gives you a much longer history than chokehold does. Uh, you could also do when affirmative action was white race for profit and uh, my, my personal favorite, the one that made things click for me in regard to systemic racism, was The Color of Law. Man, that book, just be, because it's so dispassionate, I mean, I felt like it was dispassionate, but he just gives you historical fact after historical fact after historical fact, and you just have event after event after event. And most, if not all of them, I think that he, he conveys, uh, purposefully or unintentionally, I don't know, but they're, they're largely from non-Southern places. You know, like Indiana, California, and like man. You know, I thought, I thought it was just Southerners who were mostly racist and killed people and bombed houses. Nope, not not at all. So the color of law is is just a great way to see, um, just historically, without even making all these these value judgments. Just like it's baked into the system. Um, dog whistle politics also kind of gives you a good view of of. Uh, how language has kind of changed and shifted around uh, different different ideas that, well, you know, that's not racist. Okay, well, but but how how does language kind of cover up things? Um, so that's good. And then one that that uh, for most people who listen to this podcast would be uh, in the United States, but uh, so some of these things might not, some of these books might not be all that meaningful to people who are outside of the states. But one that I think is absolutely fantastic, which it deals on the governmental level too, but it's something that I, I think also helps you to understand race and how cultures, you know, have been um, not destroyed, but uh, subverted and undermined and exploited. And just it, it helps you to see that the tendrils are much longer than, than just in the United States. And they go back much farther than, um, you know, 200 years or 150 years, the Civil War and, or Jim Crow or whatever. Uh, th and that is the book, How Europe Underdeveloped Africa. The, 
it's a fantastic book. It's one that is actually on my to read again list because it was so good, and I just want to um, I want to go through it again so that I can remember more about it. But it's a a fantastic book that shows you uh, the exploitation of Africa, and uh, you can you can see then when you read some other histories in the United States or or whatnot, you're like, okay, so you know here's what's going on in Africa. Here's here's what people are doing, um, and and it just helps you to understand. The views about people, um, why, uh, you know, there's poverty, different places and stuff. And we'll get more to that too when we get to uh, our discussion of Haiti in uh, the government section. So for our next section of recommendations, uh, I think I, I would follow similarly to the way we did, uh, the way I recommended your resources in regard to abuse was, hey, let's look at specific examples uh, and then let's go and, and explore uh, the mindset or the beliefs that people have uh, and, and see how did we get to where we are. So I think that, uh, I think that kind of seeing um, how things are today uh, or, or in modernity or recent history is really helpful uh, when we go back to history. Let me give you an example of, of why. So uh, one of the things that I think I know I experienced in my own life and talking with my wife, uh, she had a similar experience where it's, you know, 2015 and Ferguson, Missouri. And you're like, wow, police, police brutality. Like there's, there's really not that much going on. Um, and then this one instance happens and now all of a sudden it seems like the black, black community is up in arms about this, this one instance of police brutality that really is questionable. I mean, it, it was, was he a threat? Was he not a threat? Um, no, so so that's kind of the the mindset that I had at that point, and because to me, who lives in white suburbia or lived in white suburbia, that seemed new. Like that was news to me. I didn't know that. Uh, you know, I, I don't see police brutality, but when you read a book like Chokehold or The Color of Law or Condemnation of Blackness, which Condemnation of Blackness maybe should go in the next category because that that kind of goes further back. Um, but when you read those sorts of things, race for profit, when you read that uh, and, and you kind of have a vision for what modern problems are, and then you go back and read some of the books in this this next section that I'm going to get to, you're kind of like, oh, no, 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 this, these aren't new problems. Like this is stuff that they were, uh, the black community was complaining about a hundred years ago or more. Um, these are things that have been ever present, but because I am not a part of the black community and I don't have many close black friends uh, or you know people who are going to really open up about that kind of thing, of course I don't know about it. And so understanding modern problems, I think, gives you eyes to see things in history uh, that have carried over into modernity. Um, so uh, Souls of Black Folk is great. Uh, W. B. Du Bois uh, is is fantastic. I like him over Washington. Booker T. Washington. I read uh, his book. I can't think of what it's called at the moment, but um, yeah, that that's that's a topic for another day. But Souls of Black Folk, highly recommend. Washington, I'm sure it's worth the read, but uh, not too wild about it. One of one of the gems that I found here that I did not expect. Uh, I just thought it was going to be another book that I read, but it ended up being one of my favorites in this uh, in the category of race. Is David Walker's appeal to the colored citizens of the world? Man, that is uh, especially particularly for Christians. Man, he man, he zings them at you, and you're like, holy cow! And he just views the United States as Egypt, like America, the United States is Egypt oppressing people like God's justice and vengeance is coming. And it's particularly uh, particularly powerful when, you know, today a lot of conservative Christians are are uh, decrying abortion and saying, well, our, or, or homosexuality saying our nation is going to get judged because now we have gay people, right, coming out and being being uh, open about it. And you're like, do you, do you recognize, like, who your forebears are, who our forebears are? Do you recognize, like the the people that we look up to, Whitfield, uh, Edwards, um, those kinds of people? Do, do you recognize um, 
what they were responsible for and like how bad, how terrible that stuff was. You know, reading Frederick Douglass, um, uh, his, he talks about how Christians, Christian masters were the worst ones. The more religious they were, the worse they were. Um, and, and you get some of that in David Walker's appeal to the colored citizens of the world as well. He just, he lays the fire on. He's like, judgment like, is what, what is coming upon you. And largely because of the Christian uh, Christians who are justifying slavery and perpetuating the system. So I highly, highly recommend that book. Fantastic. Um, so some of the other ones, let's see, uh, Medical Apartheid is going to go back a little ways and, and talk about how uh, people were treated. There, there's a book, I forget what it's called. I don't think it's this one, uh, but there's one that, that talks about uh, the way that you know African women uh, were, were treated uh, by uh, the, the father of gynecology. We talk about that a little bit in, in the interview with Kyle uh, in this, this section. Uh, so those, those are really great. If you want to get into a more into modernity and, and get, uh, you know, more biographical, autobiographical examples, uh, you got Radio Free Dixie, which is about Robert F. Williams. Fantastic. Like one of the, I think the coolest civil rights leader, uh, but, uh, he doesn't really get attention. Um, uh, I, uh, let's see, sorry. Uh, the Myth of the American Dream and White Like Me are, are more modern, and they're written by from a white person's perspective. White Like Me, I remember really, really liking, because he kind of gives you some insight about how a white person changed their views through their experience. And so that resonated with me. Uh, if, you're, if you're white, it might resonate with you in particular. Um, and and how, how do you convert to seeing racism? Uh, when, if you want to get into the police system, I Got a Monster is, is a really powerful look at, at uh, one particular instance of policing in Baltimore and just the, the corruption that abounds in it. Um, a, a Knock at Midnight also gets into the criminal justice system. And, and uh, Waiting for an Echo also. So that's, uh, that's kind of my recommendation for more of the biographical uh, if you want to kind of take a course through history, uh, through through like particular examples of people through history, then you know going all the way back to David Walker and W. B. Du Bois and uh, and then Robert F. Williams and then up to the present in in some of the policing sorts of things. In terms of religious look, uh, if you want to kind of some Christian perspectives, uh, or or I shouldn't say Christian perspectives because I mean. That uh, that category is so broad in terms of books. These are just unique, uh, unique recommendations that I would have that that stand out. Uh, there's a lot of there are a lot of books on race from Christians, and a lot of them just kind of say the same old thing. But these particular examples I found powerful. One of them was Bad Faith by Randall Balmer, and that goes into the history of of the religious right. So if you want to take a look at politics, religion, and faith. That was good. You can listen to our interview from this section. Reconstructing the Gospel. I, I like that book uh, quite a bit. Uh, and it also deals a little bit with, with politics and such. Uh, the Color of Compromise is, uh, is good. And I know that they've got, I think, a series on Amazon Prime about that. And then Reading While Black is also fantastic. And you've got people from across the spectrum on there. Uh, Jonathan Hartgrove, I think, is the author of Reconstructing the Gospel. He's probably more what people would call liberal. Uh, I think he he went into actually a black denomination. I think he's a pastor there, if I remember correctly. Randall Balmer, not sure exactly, probably middle, middle left. And then uh, Jamar Tisby, I don't know where he is now. He used to be in my denomination, but wasn't too happy with it, understandably. Uh, and then uh, Esau McCauley, I think, would probably be considered more conservative, but I guess he's woke now because he's writing about race. Um, and then let's see, getting into, uh, just some of the, the coolest stories, uh, that, that give you kind of example of how the government has dealt with some, some people, uh, some, uh, people who've kind of shaken the, what's the phrase? Shake it, not shaken the cat. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. 
uh, rock the boat. That's it, rock the boat. Uh, Asata Shakur, man. So you know Tupac. Well, his I think aunt was like in prison and got busted out of prison and was like charged with killing a cop and all kinds of things. Uh, it's a really really shady case that they have against her. And um, she ended up fleeing to Cuba, just like Robert Williams fled to Cuba when when their trumped up charges against them and everything. Um, but her, man, she is, uh, her autobiography is just fire. Like it, her wisdom and just the, the way that she puts her words together are uh, very incisive, very uh, thought provoking. And, and I really enjoyed her autobiography. Uh, there's the Chicago Seven, which is uh, they've turned it into a movie. You can you can read about it. I'm sure there are all kinds of books about it too, and it's uh, it's just so fascinating. Um, the movie was great. I loved it. I don't know how much it was embellished at all there. I think a lot of it was was pretty spot on. But it's uh, it deals with kind of the propaganda against people, uh, especially the black community there too, and war protesters. And there's there's a big connection there. You know Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, he really rocked the boat once he started digging into the war and economics, poverty. And like I said, he was assassinated a year to the day after he gave his speech on poverty in Vietnam. Uh, it didn't take too long for him to get killed after that. So you can go read read uh, conspiracies about MLK. We'll, we'll recommend a few uh, later on in the season. I don't really get into that because it's, it's controversial, but... Uh, that would be something you could look at too. Uh, there's a, a book that King wrote called, or a compilation of King's writings called "The Radical King," which is really interesting to look at. Um, doesn't I don't think it deals too much with what we'd consider propaganda, but uh, it it might give you uncover some of his ideologies that people don't know as much. Right? Everybody always focuses on the race, and they they like to kind of brush under the rug the anti-war uh, and and anti-poverty aspects, but uh, it's important to understand all that he believed, and that might help you understand some of the uh, conspiracies surrounding him. Then there's Carl and Anne Braden. Uh, their story is really interesting if you want to get into uh, how communities uh, are polarized and, and how people were treated uh, for, for helping the black community. Of course, McNamara's Folly, which we did an episode on, is fantastic. Uh, you could also take a look at the uh, the turnaway study on abortion which uh, there are some racial components of that uh, where the, that they uncovered as far as who gets abortions why they get abortions um, yeah, all kinds of things that surround that and the propaganda of abortions uh, from from the conservative right like what are the things that they say about why women get abortions and why are women actually getting abortions and who is it and why is it uh, that that those individuals come to that position um, that they do. And I also, if you go back to my season on abortion, I, I am strongly uh, against it from a moral standpoint. But uh, in, in the season on abortion at the end, I get into the racism of the, uh, you know, uh, that abounds in abortion, not, not, you know, the idea that black babies are getting killed, but just the idea of the demographics of who are getting abortions and how that has changed or not changed over time and the injustice that that shows. So those would be some recommendations there, too, if you're interested in the topic of abortion and race. You could also look at some other things, uh, The Birth of a Nation or The Slave Bible. Those are you know, a movie, and then, of course, The Slave Bible, which they use to control the slaves. Uh, two b- huge pieces of propaganda. I don't know that I'd, I'd want to sit down and really watch The Birth of a Nation, but you know, to read about it and understand uh, how that was introduced in American culture and the impact that it had. It came out right around the time of uh, another film that we're going to talk about later in the season called The Black Stork, and uh, when we discuss eugenics. So, so getting on into some of the, uh, the different conspiracies that are out there, uh, you should definitely check out The Move Bombing. It's a fascinating story. And yes, of course, I, d- I did try to get an interview uh, with... Mike Africa Jr., but I didn't. Uh, but the move bombing, right? There's this uh, this group in Philadelphia. They they 
cause problems, right? They're loud and obnoxious and smelly, and they've got like farm animals in their yard and stuff. But there's a whole lot that goes on in in uh, in in this case where basically the Philadelphia Police Department they literally drop an aerial bomb, like a satchel of C4. So it's not like a it's not like an army bomb, right? A huge bomb, but it's a satchel of C4 that they drop from a helicopter onto a residential house and it ends up burning just this whole block that's almost exclusively a black community or it's largely a black community. Um, there's a lot that goes on into that and, and just the different conspiracy theories about them. Uh, I think one of the, the documentaries is called Let the Fire Burn. I don't remember if that's the HBO documentary or not, but there are a couple of good documentaries out there talking about the move bombing and just the way that police handle situations um, and and uh, just the different ways that certain groups of people, like whole communities, don't really have recourse against the city when they make their, their housing go up in flames. Uh, why did they do that? Would that have happened in a white community? Probably not. You could take a look deeper into things like the Tuskegee experiments. Uh, Fred, uh, look at Fred Hampton and his assassination by the FBI, uh, MLK. You can look more. We're going to get into Gary Webb and, uh, and cocaine and all that stuff when we get to the media section. But you can definitely uh, check out the crack cocaine epidemic and uh, Gary Webb's book, Dark Alliance, and uh, all that stuff. Of course, Emmett Till, you could take a look at him and a bunch of other people and, and just uh, the system uh, getting getting the murderers off. Uh, I know that there was recent talk about trying to convict, I think it was a lady who was involved uh, in it too, the one who accused Till uh, and, and kind of trying to find justice for him after all these years. But I think that kind of fell through. If you want to look at other uh, conspiracies slash, you know, different atrocities or atrocious things that have happened in regard to race, things that maybe were covered up or um, things that have gotten buried in history, uh, lots of different angles that you can look at this stuff from. But you can take a look at the Buck v. Bell case, which isn't particularly specifically about uh, you know, race necessarily, but there are a lot of people of minority status or poverty status who the case was used against in regard to eugenics. We're going to have a whole episode on that in, in our season on uh, scientific medical section, uh, but it might be worth exploring at this point. Along with the sterilization of Native American women, uh, you could take a look at the war on drugs. You know, How did it come about? Take a look at you know why Nixon implemented that and... Uh, you know, the timing of it coming right after the civil rights movement and who it affects disproportionately. Take a look at Otabenga in the Bronx Zoo, right? We had this we had this African guy, I forget where he was from, Cong uh maybe I don't think he was from the Congo. Uh I don't remember exactly. But Otabenga, right? You got this black guy, you put him in a zoo next to the chimps. Right? Uh nineteen oh six, I think. So <laughs> we're talking about the twentieth century. We had a man in a, in the zoo. Virtus Hardiman, he's got a book called A Hole in the Head, and he got a hole in the head from government experiments similar to the Tuskegee experiments. And then Ida B. Wells' uh, red, red book, right? She was tired of, I think some of her friends were uh, lynched you know, because they'd accuse black guys of, uh, of raping women, and then they'd just lynch them, right? When really they just wanted to steal their store or their property or get rid of the competition. Uh, so she created this red book that, that talks all about uh, various lynchings. And again, this is just scratching the surface. You could also go check out uh, Brian Stevenson stuff at EJI, you know, the author of uh, Just Mercy Equal Justice Initiative, I think, is his organization. He's got, you know, they, they have all kinds of lists of just the different terrible things that have taken place. Like I said, there is just absolutely so much stuff out there. So as far as other things that I didn't get to that I really wanted to that look good, but I don't know if they are, uh, there's The New Jim Crow, which I know is really popular. And then the book uh, Buried in the Bitter Waters looked interesting to me. I've got a lot more that I've, I've saved over time in my Audible list or Scribd list and stuff. 
but uh, those two kind of stood out to me as as ones that I'd like to get to in the near future. I think that's that's pretty much it for our episode here. We'll keep recapping racism in particular because we're going to see it pop up more and more uh, throughout the season. We'll continue to recap it and uh, and and touch back and see how it applies in other areas as well. But hopefully this gives you a a good start for some homework. That's all for now. So peace, and because I'm a pacifist, when I say it, I mean it. This podcast is a part of the Kingdom Outpost Network. Please check out the links below to find other great podcasts and content related to nonviolence and kingdom living.